present the news quiz with your host, Miles Jupp. Hello, and welcome to the news quiz. We start with an announcement from Wiltshire County Council, read by Diana Speed. Due to the weather forecast, the training event planned for flood wardens has been postponed. <laughs> Our right, thanks to Peter Williams and Marilyn Hunt for spotting that foolishness. Uh, now, let's meet the teams. Will you welcome first on my right, Jeremy Hardy and Terry Christian. And opposite them on my left, Camilla Long and Rich Hall. Jeremy, who's been searching for the pennies? This is to do with the fact that Google are registered as deceased for tax purposes. <laughs> <laughs> they came up with a cosy deal with HMRC. I think HMRC, you'd think they'd have been toughened up by merging with the customs, wouldn't you? Because customs men wear tri-cornered hats and have flintlocks and <laughs> burst their way into to taverns and seize people's gold. But they, they just sort of had a meeting with Google and said, well, how much would you like to give us? And Google said, not much. And they said, that's fine, thank you. <laughs> And then Cameron had to defend this in the Commons. It's been an emotional week for Cameron because in many ways Cecil Parkinson was the soundtrack to his youth. <laughs> and, uh, um, so, you know, Cameron was jumpy and, they, you know, there was a thing where they've, had to, they've lost a court judgment over the bedroom tax and, uh, so they're a bit, and they're a bit jumpy about the Google thing. So when challenged on this, Cameron went a bit weird and condemned Corbyn for meeting what he called a bunch of migrants whom he contrasted with British people and hard-working taxpayers, making a distinction between British people and hard-working taxpayers. <laughs> can, can I just defend uh, Cameron for a minute? Because a bunch of is an improvement on a swarm of. Well, that is true. <laughs> well, that, that, that is true. And it, but the, he knew it would get a reaction because it's called the dead cat strategy. And this was used very much by... Um, the Tory propagandist, recently ennobled Tory propagandist, Lord Crosby of Australia, sure. Um, <laughs> what it is, in, if you're uncomfortable with a conversation, you drop a dead cat on the table. So you say something quite horrible that takes everyone's eyes off the fact that you're talking about tax avoidance and you throw this sort of thing in. And, but then people defended Cameron saying, well, I think people find it rather refreshing. Well, I mean, one talks about a, a bunch of tulips, doesn't one? For, 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 for. But... <laughs> Rarely, rarely do you say it to stigmatise tulips and keep them out of the country. <laughs> but I thought George Osborne, uh, you know, you, I felt a bit sorry for him because he got 130 million quid, didn't he? Wanted to brag about it, and yet it's just a bit of money down the back of the sofa to Google. But I thought, I wonder if they said to him, look, George, 130 million quid, or else anyone who puts your name in our search engine... <laughs> It's going to be that photograph of you with the rolled-up fibre and that mound of what is obviously plain flour. <laughs> he was innocently trying to cover up the prostitute's buttocks <clears throat> to spare her embarrassment. <laughs> what I would love was the absolute thrill on George Osborne's face when he gave his soundbite about extracting this tiny amount of tax from Google. <laughs> Labour politicians complaining about it is a bit rich. <laughs> <laughs> there was this debate as to whether Cameron meant to say this or it slipped out, but either way, it's not good. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you plan to say something hateful and bigoted or you would plan to say something charming and dashing, but your hateful bigotry just... <laughs> Willed out because you were feeling a bit flustered. <laughs> I might be on the other side of the fence here, but I, I don't believe Google should pay any taxes. <laughs> why? I will tell you why. Because Google is magic. <laughs> Google it. Remember, you, we used to have yellow pages, right? That's yellow pages. They're gone. And they were fantastic. If you needed information, you went to the yellow pages. If you needed information from a person in an interrogation room, you hit them with the yellow pages. <laughs> it was a font of information, and it would show up magically twice, three times. This is the magic yellow pages. We don't know where they came from. <laughs> we don't know how they got there. We don't know if they made money, but if someone had said to you, hey, the yellow pages aren't paying their taxes, you would have gone, I will file that under my give a shit is broken. <laughs> we don't care. And then there were libraries. And you went there, and 
There was tons of inf- you never questioned how they made how do they make seventy p for a late book? How does this place stay in business? <laughs> And if someone said, the library is not paying taxes, you would have gone, I don't care. When Those are gone because of Google. But has anybody here ever got a bill from Google? <laughs> I don't know how they make their money. I don't care, but they are magic. And I do not question magic. And you do not pay tax. If your child <laughs> puts a tooth under the pillow and gets money, that is magic. Do you tax that? <laughs> That is magic, and Google is, I don't know what it does, it's just there, and it's magic, and no. (laughs) No taxes. It is a form of sorcery, isn't it, Rich? We should be much more grateful to these people than we are, I suspect. How how much tax should they have paid, unless you're Rich Hall and you think that they should be rewarded for their relentless sorcery? I think um, think Rich is being facetious, actually. Oh, really? I think that, that, yeah. (laughs) I'm sorry, I assumed he'd come on here to just speak the God's honest truth, Camilla. Yeah. Has, anyone, uh, has anyone ever Googled anything? <laughs> I guess not. I think it's quite nice that it can get to a level HMRC, you know, they're able to say, well, can we pay this much? You know, people like you and I, we're asked to pay a certain amount and we pay. If you get to a certain level of richness, you can just sort of haggle with the HMRC, which I think brings a charming sort of taste of the souk to the whole thing. <laughs> I mean, why, why can't we just seize their... Why, I mean, because the, the HMRC can just go into your, your bank account, can't they? Why can't uh, the government just take the money off Google? Well, With, presu- at the point of a bayonet. Why can't they do that? Because it's in America. I'm or hidden. To... It's hidden in, the, in Bermuda or something. I'll have to come back to you on that, Jeremy. I've got literally no idea why they can't storm anywhere. Um... <laughs> I mean, isn't Bermuda still ours? Have we let it go? Damn. <laughs> Does anyone know any of the answers to any of Jeremy's questions? Aren't they based in... Well, I think their European stuff is based in Ireland, isn't it? Yes, I and think, then, they, then they I think they do have... They through. have lots of offices everywhere. That's why it's so confusing. I think we, we, we could Google this and find out. <laughs> uh, inscrutably, this is the tax deal with Google, announced this week by Chancellor of the Exchequer and smirking high-vis fetishist George Osborne. <laughs> Google will pay only £130 million to cover 10 years of back taxes, which might suggest they've been let off. But I like to think the government's simply rewarding initiative, uh, or in this case, really, really rewarding initiative. (laughs) The reason for the relatively low UK tax figure is that Google claims to have no fixed base here, in which case I presume the offices of Google London at 76 and 123 Buckingham Palace Road, or indeed their offices at numbers 1 to 13 St Giles High Street, or their Manchester office in Peterhouse, Oxford Street, are all currently empty and you can all just turn up and squat the ruddy shit out of them. (laughs) George Osborne called the settlement a major success, in much the same way that Neville Chamberlain did when he came back from Germany with that lovely bit of paper. (laughs) Italy is taking a much tougher stance than the UK have done and are hoping to receive 15% of Google's revenues in their country. This is Italy we're talking about, a country which is only one more financial crisis away from having their economy run by the Dolmio puppets. (laughs) Two points to Jeremy. Terry, which bands have been disbanded? Ah, right, yeah, this is uh, the red or scarlet bands in Cardiff. And, of course, uh, these bands have been given out to refugees. And, of course, everybody's kicked up and said, it's like Nazi Germany. They give them the red wristbands and then, you know, the kind of targets for bigots are us, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, it just sort of draws attention. Yeah, it's a bit like an an all-inclusive holiday with added abuse. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I mean, I you see, I know people made a big fuss over it. I just thought it was a bit of a stupid thing to do. You know, bad taste, probably a lot cheaper than giving them identity cards. But then I thought, Madonna and Gwyneth Paltrow, they've also got red bands, haven't they? Yeah. All to do with that sort of cabal Kabal, drivel, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, I, but, but I would hope that they don't get any verbal abuse for no, their No, I hope bands. that they do. <laughs> Being a bit sarcastic oh, okay. there, you're losing the irony there. Oh, sorry. We don't do that down here. I mean, but what would they say? <laughs> they would have to be. They would be forced to eat three meals a day, which might be a frightening experience for them, I suppose. <laughs> People kept saying, "Well, it is. It, you, you have to wear a tag to go to Glastonbury," and you think. Yeah, but and that's like saying, well, I mean, what's wrong with refugee camps? I mean, people at Glastonbury have, in, have to live in unsanitary conditions in tents. 
Yeah, only for three days, and they sober up and do a presentation on Tuesday morning. <laughs> But again, we were doing the red doors. Everyone was getting stick about the red doors as well, weren't they, the other week? I think the red doors are awful. Well, I, I know. Well, I have I've, to I've say, already I written think a letter. I see it as a completely different thing from the wristbands. Uh, that was just stupidity. I've already written a letter and asked them to change them all to purple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, actually, I, will, I mean, I grew up in a council house, and what they do there is every second house, one would be blue, then it'd be yellow. We had a yellow one, then it'd be blue. And every four years, you come round and paint them. Nobody ever investigated this, but they actually used to nick all the spare uh, blue and yellow paint and then make green paint. <laughs> no, seriously, no, a mate of mine used to do that. And then they'd go, you know, to do your house as a private job. And when, if you said, I want it painted black or I want it painted white, they'd say, well, I tell you what's in at the moment, love, holly green. <laughs> about tagging people is when you I mean you can't things a bit more loaded aren't they when you fled a dictatorship officialdom as a, you know is not seen as a benign thing so if someone says you have to wear this now you're sort of thinking it's like Nazi Germany you're thinking it's like Nazi Germany <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed this a lot lately. People jump right to the Hitler card, you know, like they say, oh, you're playing the Hitler card, like first round. Like there, there's some gradations between painting a door red and saying this is like Nazi Germany. We do have this fixation, don't we, in the UK of like uh, getting a bit all World War II about everything. You know, if it's queuing at Wimbledon, it's like Dunkirk, <laughs> you know, <laughs> sort of uh, waiting by the Thames for the Royal Flotilla. It's like the Blitz Spirit, because it's raining. <laughs> Trying to get on you a know. ferry, it's like Dover. <laughs> people you the, know, people in Dover are really paranoid about the refugees in California. Do you know what? They want to come here. They want to come here. All oh, 6,000 of them, they, they want to come here. think, no, don't flatter yourselves, Dover. They want to go through you. They want to go through you. <laughs> I mean, I think and some... Uh, wait a minute. So, do we get an extra point for that? <laughs> Can we not no, get an Terry, extra point for that? Terry, Terry, that was an act of aggression. <laughs> it's... <laughs> We want to win this quiz. It's like the Battle of Stalingrad, this quiz, isn't it? No, I don't think anyone has ever come on this programme and cared about the points, Terry. This is... <laughs> in many ways, you represent new territory for me. Uh... <laughs> Accursedly, this was the plight of asylum seekers in Cardiff who were required to wear red wristbands in order to receive food. The firm responsible said that the wristbands were never meant to discriminate, merely a stopgap solution, while the branding iron was away for repair. <laughs> The biggest problem for the asylum seekers was that when wearing the wristbands, they were frequently mistaken for supporters of the Labour Party. <laughs> After a lifetime of brutal persecution, this, for many, was the final indignity. <laughs> when you see someone with a red wristband, you know they're not to be trusted, said a proud indigenous resident of Cardiff, resplendent in his traditional electronic tag. <laughs> Two points to Terry. Rich, which bunch of cowboys finally met their not-okay corral? Somewhere in the, in, in the nether regions of Oregon, and, and not the, the cool part of Oregon that we all think of, where Nike is on the coast, out in the desert, there is a lot of um, federal land, and uh, this is given over to grazing to ranchers, and they, in turn, are supposed to pay some taxes. <laughs> pay some taxes, not like Google. They're supposed to pay taxes on the uh, money that they make from raising cows. And uh, you have a group of militiamen that, who aren't even from that area who just decided to show up at this wildlife refuge center and claim that uh, they shouldn't have to pay any taxes. And this has resulted in an armed standoff in that American way of we got some guns and uh, we have the right to form a militia, according to the Constitution, and never ever realizing that if the government wants to it's just they will. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you've got a couple of guns. Well, they have tanks. <laughs> and, and death beams. <laughs> Lasers and drones. And, uh, you know, you're a couple of cowboys with your... <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, it never works. So now one of, them, one of them's dead and another one has been shot. When they're asking for land reform, then, are they... By land reform, do they mean we should be allowed to use this land without paying... Tax is that all that land reform means in this? Uh, it's 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 a symbol for just the fact that they hate the government. They hate the the government. I should I should say government. G U B M E N T. Because every one of these guys <laughs> spells the, the government. The government's coming and take it. The government can take my do my dead prying fingers around and uh, <laughs> because Americans just 
love guns. And that's what it's about. It's about to stand there with a gun, which gives you a heart on and makes you feel important. And, uh, and they say, well, somebody's going to try and take my stuff. You're going to take my... Well, buy a lock. <laughs> <laughs> I have over 300,000 used tires in my barn. <laughs> Why? It's better to have them and not need them than to need them and not have them. That's why I, <laughs> I will shoot. I will shoot. We just, you know. The Constitution was written 270 years ago. It was, you know, it, it didn't have anything to do with modern day uh, arms. It was muskets. It was, if somebody was coming after you, it was, hey, what, what, back up. And, Pour powder in, plus, plus that, and then put the thing down, the wadding, and then put that rod in it, and then, oh, he's gone. So, <laughs> it had nothing to do with, uh, you know, modern day arm, armaments. And there's something about Americans, God bless them, that they just love guns. Love them, because it makes them happy. Makes them happy, guns make Americans happy. It's important to keep Americans happy because they have guns. <laughs> And put it any other way, and the cowboy image is dying. It's dead. Uh, if you don't believe it, watch me leave the studio tonight and walk down the street and just attract a lot of gay men. That's all. <laughs> I should point out I'm wearing a vest and a cowboy hat because I, I thought this was a TV show. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, made the effort more than I can say for you people. <laughs> but. Uh, I didn't realize. And nothing is going to be, it's not going to change, but there's these guys who just, they, they've watched way too many Westerns and they still think they're, they're, you know, valid. Is there any aspect of the lifestyle that you buy into? Do you, I mean, do you, do you have a ranch or anything? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's mine, it's not government land, is it? It's my land. But you don't keep a gun on your ranch? Do I keep a gun? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> But it's not, I mean, just a 22 rifle. I mean, you know, come on. We've all shot at each other with those things, right? <laughs> My neighbor has an AK-47. My next door neighbor has an AK, wants to go duck hunting. Knocks on my door. <laughs> wants to go duck hunting with an AK-47. I said, how many ducks are coming at It's all very keeping up with the Joneses, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and I said, uh, we're done, let's go home. <laughs> AK-47. I'm going to bring a loaf of bread. You bring that AK-47. <laughs> see who captures more ducks. <laughs> the American else? fairgrounds are fun, though. You know, because people must surely bring their own guns. Instead of you get given some stupid little air rifle with the sight all twisted so you can't hit the tin cans, a couple of ranchers just turn up with M16 rifles and a bazooka and just take the place out. <laughs> Vicariously, this is the standoff in the state of Oregon where an armed siege was organised to protest at land reform following the jailing of two ranchers. The militia occupied the refuge on the 2nd of January after yet another hastily made and easily regretted New Year's resolution. <laughs> this week, one of the leaders of the protest was arrested while leaving the refuge to get supplies, which seems very necessary. You can hardly expect armed ranchers in a wildlife refuge to simply live off the land. <laughs> Still, let's hope this doesn't lead to copycat incidents. The last thing we want is Nigel Farage sending a message to Brussels by squatting in a rare breeds farm. <laughs> Two points to Rich. And at the end of round one, the scores are Jeremy and Terry have six, and Camilla and Rich have seven. <gasps> Go! <laughs> we start round two with a recipe suggestion from Woman's Hour. For the smoothest cashew cheese, be sure to soak your nuts overnight in filtered water. <laughs> Our uh, thanks to Simon Maloney for trawling the internet to find that soothing advice. Um, Jeremy, who's been sent to Coventry for snooping around Coventry? The Babylon Dem. <laughs> the, um, the Rothers, uh, officers of the law in Cove, um, have been tweeting. I mean, this is, they're on Twitter. I don't know who follows the police on Twitter. You have to be an incredibly law abiding person, I think. Like that to follow the local constabulary, but they tweet, and they've been just going into people's homes uh, to show how um, feeble their, their security is. 
A bit like an uncle who, like, punches you in the stomach to teach you to keep your guard up all the time. <laughs> you know, they, um, they, uh, they've just been letting themselves in and tweet it. Maybe it's a thing, cos I know it's not the north, but it's north of here now. Um, <laughs> this is the, where we're broadcasting from. It might, it might surprise you to know England that this is the southeast. And <laughs> my in-laws are... Well, I'm, my, I'm not married to my partner, so they're, they're sort of common in... Common law in... They're quite common. They're, <laughs> One's from Birmingham and one's from Yorkshire, and they both will just walk into your house without knocking. And maybe it's just a northern thing that people do. And because think, people assume that if you Coventry, shout cooey, it's not sorry. trespass. Coventry's not the north, huh? is it? It's north of here. No, it's the Midlands. Right. It's the West Midlands. <laughs> it's the West Midlands. But it's just this idea that you can just walk in. And my mum used to leave the back door unlocked in our house, and people would just walk in and shout cooey, and it was considered acceptable, and I never thought it was. Were they you people should... she knew? Usually, yeah. <laughs> You might be naked, you might be doing something you shouldn't be doing. People shouldn't just walk in, certainly not the police. They're supposed to know about the law of trespass and stuff like that. They're not supposed to... Oh, that glass looks a bit thin. Oh, look how easy it is to put a wheelie bin through that glass. <laughs> oh, look, look, this old lady looks a bit vulnerable sitting there. Look how easy it is to drag her to the floor and force her to tell us where her jewellery is kept. Look, you've got to have stronger old people than this if you don't want their jewellery taken away from you. So the police in Coventry just break into your house and then tweet a picture of them doing what burglars defecating on the, on the <laughs> ground. <laughs> look, look how easy it is to get this stereo out and put it and drive it back to the station and sell it. <laughs> and, and, then they, and then they punish... And, and, but, you know, they're not allowed to, are they? I don't think... I mean, I know customs can walk into your house. Customs have more power than even traffic wardens. Customs men. <laughs> But I don't think the police are allowed to just walk into your home. I think they need a, they need a warrant. They need to be invited. Like, like bailiffs and vampires, they need, to be, <laughs> they need to be invited into your home. If you discover one of them, who does the arresting? Very good point. You could conduct you see, a citizen's a arrest. that's a loophole here. Exactly. You, can't, you could actually say, I'm going to arrest you. And how do I know that you're really a police officer and not a stripper? <laughs> How many people in Coventry do you imagine were following the Coventry Police Twitter feed prior to this? Uh, Presumably criminals appearance? are following them so they can know where they are and break into <laughs> all the other places. Oh, yeah, because if they're, if they're, sometimes on tweets people put, like, a sort of location pin, can't they? They can yeah. be making it... God, they can be making it incredibly easy for people as well. They don't, they don't work anyway, those things. Everyone kept asking me last week, why are you in Somerset? I thought, I'm not, I'm in Stockport. <laughs> were you going into people's houses, Terry? Uh, <laughs> Never. That would be quite an extraordinary... To see it in Twitter or in the flesh, thought that Ter Terry <laughs> Christian is, for some reason, in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy was making suggestions that um, people in the north are more relaxed. Terry? Um, yeah, well, Jeremy thinks it's all right to have a dig at people in the north all the time, don't Only it? my mother-in-law. It's a form of racism. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's disgraceful. It, it was just suggested that people were slightly more relaxed about their, about when, their back doors. When, um, when, when I was a... <laughs> uh, <laughs> exactly. When I was a kid, my mum always said to me, the streets of London are paved with bastards. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, we do bury them. And, <laughs> and down here they tell you anything, don't they? I remember, like, first time I met a lad from London, he was telling me they had trains that go under the ground and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> You shouldn't have to lock your door. Sometimes you might want to nip around the shop and not have to take your keys or lock up, and you might just leave the door open. You should be allowed to do it. I mean, it shouldn't be a presumption that just because your house isn't, isn't hermetically sealed that, that you're fair game <laughs> and you're no better than you ought to be and you're well up for it. <laughs> just because you've left the door on the latch, you might just be going out to get a paper. I'm going or to get say something out the car. I'm going to say something quite unsexy, but that would probably invalidate your home and contents policy. <laughs> Like they're ever going to pay out anyway. Oh, so you were outside the house. And where was this holiday? In another country. So you left the house and you went to another country. I'm afraid you're not covered for that. <laughs> and you're asthmatic. Oh, dear. Oh, you should have declared that. <laughs> In some of the tweets, they were sort of explaining their procedure. And they said they would sort of try the windows. And then they said that they would shout for occupants as well. <laughs> so not only are they invading your home, but they're sort of shouting at you from outside your home in the manner of a proper raid. <laughs> in a Coventry accent. Yeah. Get on the floor, he said, I'd. <laughs> it like that, yes. <laughs> Rich, have you ever experienced anything like this? 
Yeah, uh, I remember when I was with NWA and then the, uh, <laughs> we were just trying to record an album and the police just came right in and made us all lie down with our hands behind us. And I remember saying to Easy E, I said, we need to write a song about this. <laughs> They could have spun it a different way. Why can't the police say, look, this town is so crime-free that we can walk into any house and just, there's nothing, there's no crime going on. You can leave your doors unlocked because that is a sign of, of friendliness. That is a sign of, a, if it's friendlier up north, you know, where I live in Montana, people like, to, why this town, there is very little crime in my town and people will, oh, you can take your stuff and put it out on the front lawn at night and it'll be there in the morning. And so we do that. <laughs> Every night, we take all our belongings and put them out on the front lawn. But nobody wants anything in Montana. Who wants antler furniture? <laughs> NASCAR bobble-headed dog. And I imagine Coventry... I've been to Coventry, and you know what? There's nothing there I want. <laughs> Not a thing. Impishly, these are the antics, and there's no other word for them, of police in Coventry who have been walking into people's unlocked houses, taking pictures of themselves, and then tweeting the results. Amazing to think that there's someone who would be worse at presenting through the keyhole than Keith Lemon. <laughs> Whatever he is. <laughs> this is a break from standard police procedure. Normally, if police want to enter a household, they have to go through the more rigorous process of posing as an anarchist, staying for three years, and fathering a child. <laughs> Following the success of this venture, the next day the police showed everyone how easy it is to hotwire a car and ram raid a branch of curries. <laughs> then the day after, they demonstrated how to dispose of a corpse using just some old carpeting, some quicklime, and a disused quarry. <laughs> and of course, our old friend Gravity. Um, anyway, if you are a burglar listening on a set that someone has left on for safety, make sure you're dressed up as a police officer and do remember to tweet what you're up to. <laughs> Two points to Jeremy. Terry, have a listen to this. Who's got the balls to look for a prize? The lottery ticket, isn't it? The missing millions that they've now found the real owner of, the right ticket. Have they found them now? Yeah, yeah. Oh, they, really? found, they found the real person, which has sort of spoiled it a bit for me, because... <laughs> and it's not that I'm kind of a bit bent, but, you know, obviously, <laughs> where we're from, we, there's a sort of Robin Hood aspect about <laughs> fraudsters. <laughs> <laughs> it's a victimless crime, isn't it? <laughs> if they can't look in your eye, as you take it. So basically, there was the, the old grandma. <laughs> no, there was the old grandma, wasn't there, who had the numbers. <laughs> but somehow, she'd put it in the wash, a lottery ticket, and it had all sort of come off. It was almost like... Uh, so it was an image, wasn't it, that she'd kind of got of the actual winning lottery ticket, but without the barcode without the date. But it did have the winning numbers. It had the winning numbers. It was a kind of lottery ticket Turing shroud. <laughs> you know? But my favourite one was uh, that when, the, when the old grandma got confronted, didn't she, about her forged ticket, and, and I loved the response when it was suggested that it was a forgery. And I've written it down, so I can give it you verbatim. And she said, why would I make it up? <laughs> Why, indeed. <laughs> Didn't they discover that she, she was then sort of... Um, uh, she'd been caught doing practically the same thing um, with, a, with a scratch card, pretending that she'd got £200 on a scratch card, but she dropped it in a puddle. And, oh, look, the last, the last scratch card bit has been obscured, but it's real. Worth a punt. Yeah. <laughs> you could counterfeit money, couldn't you? Just, oh, I just dropped it in some bleach. I know, it just, I know it just looks like paper, but that was a 20. And I've drawn it on with my Yeah, pencil. I've drawn it on, obviously. Yeah. It'd be disrespectful to the Queen not to have a go. I, I've never bought a lottery ticket, but I, I, I met a man once named, named Liam O'Malley. He was a 4'11", um, uh, freckled Irish Elvis impersonator. <laughs> and he, uh, Did he give you three wishes? Yeah. <laughs> And, and he used to buy the scratch-off tickets, and, and this is one. This is amazing advice. He um, he says, you know, I always scratch off five of the numbers, and I never scratch off the sixth one. I always just throw the ticket in the bin. And I said, why? And he says, well, what if, if those first five numbers match? 
that's, you know, already a miracle. There's no chance in the world that the sixth number is going to match. I'm not going to win, but it's, it's the what if. It's, I'd rather walk around and think, what if I had won? Because I know I'm not going to win, but what if? Because what if is what fuels writing and art and, 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 and love and dreams is what if. What if is what keeps us going, and what if is far more important than, than a winning lottery ticket. It, it does fuel people's dreams in, in the most perverse way because, you know, you're not going to win. You are not going to win. More people buy lottery tickets than vote. If you want to change your life, vote. <laughs> That's the biggest load of bullshit I've ever... Stop clapping! <laughs> we, we tried you, voting. You, That's why we do the lottery. Yeah. <laughs> Randomly, this is the shock news, that if you announce that you have 33 million in unclaimed lottery winnings, one or two people may come forward to try and claim it. <laughs> Camelot said that the prize has now been legally claimed, but this did not stop hundreds of people going after the money earlier this week on the entirely reasonable and very sensible grounds that they had heard about it. <laughs> One woman in Worcester who claimed to have won the jackpot had been inviting people into her home to have a look at a photo of her ticket. I think what we can gather from this is that Worcester is in desperate need of a good museum. <laughs> Two points to Terry. Camilla, have a listen to this. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Camilla, who's pulled an old rabbit out of the hat to add to the kitty? I think this is the Beatrix Potter story, isn't it? The, the lost hundred-year-old tale which has been found in an archive somewhere all of a sudden and is going to be delivered to all the hot little hands in the country at some point soon. And it's this... Uh, it's ex almost exactly the same as everything else that she's written. It's called... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's a slight twist. It's called Kitty in Boots. It's about a, a well-behaved cat who leads a double life. And this cat has a sort of gentleman's jacket and some boots as well. I thought you meant it worked in boots. No, I think, I, I think it's got Peter Rabbit in it and it's got Mrs Tiggy Winkle and... Um... Champion the Wonder Horse? <laughs> no, just... Just the Beatrix Potter oh. characters, actually. Um, <laughs> I think it's sort of a bit like a kind of Expendables of Roadkill, essentially. <laughs> and this year, what's... Uh, it's an extraordinary coincidence, but this year happens to mark the 150th anniversary of Potter's birth. So uh, it's extraordinarily lucky that a book like this should suddenly be found... <laughs> I've actually been to a house. A house? Well, her house. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, in the, in the, in the late days... <laughs> with the, in Coventry, with the police. <laughs> no, no, it's in the late... Is it called Hill, Hilltop House or something? In the Lake District. And oh, I yeah. tell you, I mean, I never really got on with all her stuff. But it's all Japanese there. They absolutely love Beatrix Potter. You know, Mrs Tiggy Winkle, Peter Rabbit and all the other lovely animals. And uh, read them avidly. Can I, can, can I consult with my colleague on this? <laughs> Absolutely. Who the hell is Beatrix Potter? <laughs> um, she was a very, very well-loved English children's author who wrote yeah. very well-loved, sensible stories about talking animals being mutilated. <laughs> sort of our equivalent of the, the novels of John Steinbeck. Or, uh... <laughs> Basically... Beatrix Potter and Dennis Potter got married and, and had Harry <laughs> Potter. <laughs> and and that's where Harry English film from. was born. <laughs> Is she the one they found buried under the car park in uh, Leicester? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. She was reburied uh, live on television in a <laughs> very confusing ceremony. Um, <laughs> Sumptuously, this is the arrival of a previously unpublished children's story by the much-loved Beatrix Potter. It's being published to tie in with the 150th anniversary of Potter's death, which is a touching move. And what better way to celebrate someone's birth than to rifle through their stuff in a cynical attempt to make money? <laughs> anyway, I won't be reading it. Like all Beatrix Potter books, I'll just sit back and wait for the plate to come out. <laughs> Two points to Camilla. 
Rich, who's all at sea? Uh, this is the story of two sailors who have been rescued for the ninth time this week. Uh, I need to start this story by telling you that, that a bucket list is a fine thing. <laughs> we all need a bucket list, but if your bucket list consists of getting in a boat in Norway and trying to float to America and being rescued by the Coast Guard, at some point you've got to look at your, you know, your nautical skills and just say, why didn't we just go see the Northern Lights and <laughs> be done with it? Because these clowns have, have been rescued, I think, eight, nine times by the Coast Guard. Uh, they made it to Cornwall, and then their boat caught on fire on land. <laughs> on land. Uh, they docked it. Uh, the tide went out. They didn't see that one coming. And uh, flipped over. They had a candle. Because, you know, modern, a modern navigational aid, a candle, which <laughs> apparently if moss grows on one side of it, you can see what direction you're heading in. I have no idea. And the candle set the boat on fire, and the uh, fire brigade came out and put the boat out, and then the guy said, oh, we're fine, we've, we've made it all the way from Norway to Cornwall, with only, only being rescued nine times, so it should be pretty smooth sailing across the Atlantic, and they should not be doing what they're doing. The Coast Guard has more important things to do. Yes. <laughs> It does seem like the sort of thing, if it was a film, you'd think, what a charming idea, sort of two old chaps is... going around Britain and think, but actually, I think it's actually happening. No, this has got to yeah, stop. Yeah, I think it's no, already did just that, a yeah. couple of nice old guys who are at the end of their life and thought, oh, what could go wrong? I think it's cute because, the, you know, why is everything dominated by people who are good at stuff? Well, you think, oh, <laughs> I, run, I run 4K for Hair Follicle Awareness Day. <laughs> And you think, yeah, but you're good at it. So where's the, where's the challenge in that? You've trained, haven't you? You've trained to do the marathon. You know you could do it. You wouldn't do the marathon if you hadn't trained or highly asthmatic and had never got out of bed in your life. It's because you've trained for months and been on a special diet and got fit. I think it's nice. Complete idiots who have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> but have a go. Isn't that what made this country great? <laughs> Do you think it's fun to watch people that aren't good at something attempting it? Yes! Who think... wants to watch experts do something? It's like, you know... These are not... the sort of sports rights that the BBC I... could obtain, actually, couldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the BBC won a 50-year contract to exclusively screen shit cricket. Or... <laughs> <laughs> that's why, that's why people sports... who cannot play football. <laughs> difference between being not expert and actually not knowing one end of a boat from the other. Not actually even being able to get on the boat that, yeah, or that, stay on it. Or that's not. the case you should be in a canoe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That> was it. <laughs> Lifeboatmen are all volunteers, so unless you go out and get into masses of trouble in a storm, they've just got to carry on doing their job. Whereas if you go out and get into loads of trouble, they get to leave work. Then, uh, and, and run out, and it's all very exciting. Have you seen a lifeboat being launched? It's fantastic. It looks really exciting. And they're all made out of bottle tops that people sent into Blue Peter <laughs> in the 60s. It's great. I love the fact that the boat was called Nora. Aww. Later, flaming Nora, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Terry, have you ever seen anything like this? Uh, last of the summer wine, I think. <laughs> Quixotically, this is the nautical yarn of two sailors in their 70s who have had to be rescued by the RNLI nine times in the last seven months. And I clearly use the word sailors here incredibly, incredibly loosely. <laughs> in their latest escapade, the boat tipped over in Cornwall, causing a candle to fall and set fire to their clothes. One of the sailors said they'd failed to blow the candle out properly. Um, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I probably wouldn't try to sail from Norway to America if I wasn't confident in my abilities to, at the very least, blow a candle out. <laughs> if women and children can cross the Mediterranean on a makeshift raft, while these guys are unable to leave the coast of Britain in a 40-foot yacht, perhaps there's more to being a migrant than David Cameron would have us believe. <laughs> I don't know if the pair are News Quiz fans, but hello, guys, if you're listening during the brief period before your accidentally buttered hands drop the radio out of a porthole. <laughs> anyway, a light-hearted and entertaining story that I'm sure will be just as funny, even if they drown before the Saturday repeat. <laughs> Before we reveal the final scores, has anybody got a cutting they'd like to share? Terry? Yeah, this is sent in uh, by John Pryor. It's from the St Ives Times and Echo. 
and uh, it's, the headline was Sewage Back in the Spotlight. St Ives' ongoing battle against sewage was back on the agenda last night as local councillors sat around to decide where to go next. <laughs> <laughs> Camilla. Oh, yes, this is a, uh, something sent in by Julian Clark in Plymouth, um, and it's an offer for a boudoir photo shoot with a makeover. Models can show off their sexy side with a photo shoot experience and receive two prints, one of them mounted. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. Somebody... Baffling, baffling. Rich. Uh, this is a report from CNN sent in by Paul Tiddensor. According to a senior park official at the Wangi National Park in Zimbabwe, Cecil the Lion's brother, Jericho, who is also a lion, <laughs> well, that, that, yeah, enjoy yourselves, because now it gets tragic, was, <laughs> was killed on Saturday. <laughs> killed in a uh, drive-by, actually. <laughs> I think it's gang-related. <laughs> Thank you. And now let's take a look at the final score. Jeremy and Terry have 11, but Camilla and Rich have 12. <laughs> Before we leave you, here is a story from the Hull Daily Mail sent in by Neil Armitage. Businesses along Hull Marina are suffering because of ongoing regeneration works. It'll be months or even a year until we're properly open for business again, the pub owner said. All of us at the marina are in the same boat. <laughs> and with that, goodbye. Taking part in the news quiz were Jeremy Hardy, Terry Christian, Camilla Long and Rich Hall. In the chair was Miles Jupp and the news is read by me, Diana Speed. The chair's script was written by Gareth Gwynn, James Kettle and Simon Littlefield, with additional material by Liam Byrne and Kerry Pritchard McLean. The producer was Richard Morris and it was a BBC Radio comedy production.